Uh, how about this? Let's go. Ooh, there we go. Mm, da, da, da. Um, and bring the chat window to the four here up front so I can read it while looking at y'all. Um, uh, ooh, and uh, um, uh, Andrew. Thank you so much for sharing Aaron's Twitch channel. I, I meant I was going to ask somebody to do that. If you want to watch Aaron do his playthrough, uh, go ahead and give that a follow. Um, and um, um, and yeah, uh, I hope those of you that remember this game fondly from the past um, are excited about the new playthrough. Um, I hope those of you that have never heard about this game before, I'm just so glad to be able to let you know about it. Um, let me um, let me check out here. Um, um, uh, we can we can kind of chat about whatever. Um, I'm even a little bit tempted. Um, I, I, I will say again, for people who won't, weren't around for the uh, beginning of this, um, it, I don't know if it's my favorite game ever, but I cannot think of a game that has ever surprised and impressed me more. Um, um Um, yeah, and again, uh, tell your friends, they're releasing, the reason we started, I started wanting to play it again is because Aaron knew that they were re-releasing it, like, as sort of a final cut with a lot more voiceover options, or, like, a lot of vo more voiceover stuff done, and I think they've just completed the port onto PlayStation, which is when Aaron will be, uh, uh, you know, he'll be buying it on Tuesday and playing it there. Um, it is, it's amazingly well written, but more importantly, it's amazingly well designed. Uh, because for a game, sort of like design does have to come before the writing if the writing is going to be appropriately showcased. Um, um, in the same way that it kind of doesn't matter how good the writing is in a book, if all the pages are glued together or if the typeface is very small. Um, 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 uh, Darley, you're right. It is written amazingly and it handles the subjects with like amazing deftness. Um, um, yeah. Hold on. Uh, first time viewer, it's delightful seeing a writer's thoughts on the game. Do you have any criticisms or things you didn't like during your first playthrough? Um, preferably without spoilers. Yeah, we're we're pretty no spoiler here. Um, um, uh, I mean, part of what I'm doing here when I play through with Aaron is to have somebody to talk a uh, talk with the game about. Um. I, uh, you know, I, I really, I really love it. There's so much there. Um, do I have any criticisms? Well, sure. I quibble about everything. Um, and I have a kind of a critical faculty that's like a wood chipper. Um, uh, one of the things I was a little critical of is the fact that like your clothing enhances attributes that are kind of like nonsensical and that sort of damages the immersion in the gameplay a little bit because, you know, this is a game where, you know, if you get it, if you do get a plus one to your roll, that's kind of a big thing. So like suddenly it's like, oh, if I wear these plant pants, I get, you know, a bonus to persuasion. Oh no, wait, but they, you know, if, if I, I need to wear different pants, if I want my savoir faire to be higher, you know, um, <clears throat> um, so that I don't like just because, you know, 
I don't want to stop and think, okay, no, I want to, you know, say this to this person. Oh, wait, let me exit. Let me back out of this conversation so I can put on a different pair of shoes before I try to like intimidate you. Um, um, yeah, Brimstone here says it feels like a very gamey design choice. Um, and somebody says, I like the head cannon of superhero costume change. Now, superhero costume change would be one thing, and that actually you could incorporate into the design of a game. But in my opinion, you know, the whole way that the game is designed, um, you sort of you fail. And then maybe you can come back and try again, but sometimes you really fail. And that's not a great way for a game, you know. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be playing the game and think, ooh, wait, I I if I'm gonna do this dialogue choice, I need to quick stop this conversation and change my pants. Like it's not immersive, you know, it's not it's not a design choice that improves the narrative of the game. Um, now, again, does it make sense that, like, if you want to swan around wearing, like, full, like, a full police uniform, it would make sense that you would have more authority or that it would improve your esprit de corps in the game, which is your ability to, like, be a part of cop culture. Um, but, like... You know, and does it make sense that a pair of shoes might be slippery and therefore it's harder to jump around in? Sure. But, you know, a lot of the things, like uh, the pair of pants that I'm wearing actually improve my drug use, which is kind of funny. But, you know, you should either, like, putting, you, pants make me good at drugs and saying, but also your shoes are slippery. Those seem like, but like there is a similar mechanic. It's the same mechanic, but one of these is kind of tongue in cheek and funny, and the other is kind of realistic. Um, um, if if all of the things that they influenced made really perfect sense then it would make sense. Like maybe you want to take off your your police outfit before you go over there and talk to the gang of street urchins. You know, that would make sense. But again, like, oh no, wait, you know, I need to wear a different necktie before I attempt to analyze this crime scene because it gives me a logic bonus. Yeah. Um. My thoughts about how stat bonuses could be implemented. Well, just what I'm talking about right now. Like, like maybe, you know, maybe uh, the right necktie might give you a bonus to authority. Or it might, you know, help in certain ways. Um, but by and large, um, you know, I think for, for my experience... Given that, like, I really my character is is so sad and so troubled and so like, and right now I have I have spent no skill points, so I feel like horribly at a disadvantage. Like the thought of getting a couple of pluses sounds really nice. Um, it's hard for me to fight those system manipulator impulses. And just like play this game and enjoy the story. Um, you know, part of good game design is making a game that if I play it, I will enjoy it. And a game like this, the story is a huge part of it. The fact that they've given me this system to manipulate and then, you know, and, and I might say like I constantly feel like I have to change my clothes to succeed actions. The designer could say, well, you don't have to. And I'm like, you made this system in a game. And part of playing a game is using the systems of the game. So don't put a system in here and then say, oh, don't use it. But if I do use it to its fullest extent, 
I'm constantly quitting conversations or changing my clothes in order to have a better chance of succeeding. And that doesn't add to my gameplay experience. Um, um, yeah, there we go. Uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes says, this case is rather singular, Watson. Fetch me my observation tie. Now again, a pair of glasses? Yes, better observation. Um, uh, Shoes for running? Sure. Um, because, again, there is a joy in, like, collecting, you know, like, more items and getting bonuses. And I love that as part of games. I mean, I'm, obviously, we all enjoy that, uh, especially a game with an economy where you have money and you could find treasure. And, you know, even though this is a cop game, like, it's nice to get bonuses. Um but, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> um, um, oh, somebody here says, I agree. Um, I wasted a lot of time repeatedly checking my very full inventory of clothes. Um, um, yeah. Well, no, here's the thing. It's not a clever mechanic. I don't think, I mean, there are clever mechanics in this game. The passive way skill checks work, the character creation system, the way that skills are explained and implemented. That is clever. Like doing, like making Diablo-esque clothing options for this game that's not clever that's just something everyone does without thinking of it because it's just what you do in a video game that's the opposite of clever now again maybe maybe there is an element to this design choice that i'm unaware of you know you know maybe it does add something like, and again, this is the smallest of quibbles. Somebody's like, what bugs you about this game? And I'm like, I love it. It's amazing. You should absolutely buy it and experience on it on your own and then sing the praises of the developer constantly because this game took risks. It took time and energy to develop. You know, they they were brave and amazing and innovative. Um and poured a ton of time and energy. Whoever supported this game, um, it deserves so much credit. Um, but, you know, so like, this is, but this is one thing where I'm like, it's sort of like if you go to dinner at an amazing restaurant and have the best night of your life and then complain that, like, you know, the tablecloth you know, it sort of felt smooth and you'd rather it, you know, your plate kind of stuck to it a little bit, you know, like, you know, if that's the worst thing you can think about for your fabulous birthday party, like, it's not that bad. Now, that's just it. Uh, Cosmic says, I'm glad they at least attempt to make the stats tie into the close sense in the world. And that is, that that itself is, um, um, you know, that that is true. Like, if any pants were going to give you a bonus to drug use, it would be those pants in the game. And the fact that, like, they do make maneuvering your body more difficult is totally, like, if like, if you ever wore like really tight jeans to go rock climbing, like it makes you suck at rock climbing. That's very appropriate. Um, um, it, 
And here somebody says, I believe it began as a uh, tabletop role-playing rule set before they turned it into this. Um, uh, um, I do think, I, I do know I uh, that the person created this world and the history and there was a couple attempts to make different sorts of games out of it. Um, have I seen the have I seen the Game Awards acceptance speech where they thank Marx and Engels? No. No, I did not. Uh, any other games I'd recommend? Um kind of depends on what sort of thing you're into i mean i i really enjoyed the witness but it's utterly unlike these games if you're okay playing older games fallout 2 is amazing um 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 you know like uh uh Somebody else here has said, uh, uh, I want to play Ghost of Tsushima almost entirely in my traveling kimono, but I can com feel compelled to switch into one of three other armors to max my abilities, which is also disappointing. Um, 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 yeah, it... You know, I never used to be the sort of person who understood it's like, oh, wait, you can buy a hat in this game. And so you spend like 15 real world dollars so your character can wear a hat. Um, but, you know, now I've watched a bunch of Fortnite and I kind of get it. Uh, anyone who watched my Witcher playthrough remembers that, like, I spent most of that game running around uh, naked. Um um, I mean, my, the character in the game ran around naked. Um, yeah, Kaka, indeed. Um, Witness is free on PS4 not right now. Uh, Fallout New Vegas, uh, was quite good in my opinion. Yeah. Um, Um. Oh, hold on. I've heard this is similar to Planescape Torment. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll also say, uh, Torment. Uh, hold on. Do we still have the command Numenera? I was doing my playthrough of that. Does it come up? Did I misspell it? Torment. Torment's way easier to spell than Numenera. Um, <clears throat> um, um, we do Hold on. commands. I probably just misspelled Numenera. Bang, Numenera. Ah, yeah, so I'll highly recommend uh, Tides of Numenera, which uh, is sort of a an older style game. It's more of a strict third-person isometric than this, and it uh, uses a very different system, uh, which is a, a very good system. Uh, but there's a, if you like games with a lot of narrative depth and character interaction and good dialogue, uh, complexity, uh, Tides of Numenera there is a big win. Um, I wrote a piece of it. I wrote one of the companion characters. Um, 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 and, uh, if you click on that link, you can wander over and you get both the game code for like the fanciest version of the game, um, and a gift uh, like a, a store credit over at Monty Cook Games, uh, save some money. All the proceeds go to charity. Um, 
Um, I mean, I played the original Baldur's Gate and I loved it a lot. I don't know. I don't know how much I'm looking for a D and D game these days. Um, it, I, it to me, it really depends. Like, how's the story? Um, you know. I think I played Divinity Original Sin 2. It's it's blurry. I remember the tactical combat was fairly impressive. Um, <clears throat> um oh, uh, an, an original backer of the Torment Kickstarter. That is quite impressive. Um, um I do not know. I don't think I've played Tyranny. Um you know, I remember Detroit uh, became become human. Uh, okay, I'm I'm looking at this YouTube video of the Disco Elysium folks. All right, and the game award goes to Disco Elysium. Disco Elysium also wins best independent game. Tonight, they're taking home a total of four game awards. They won four game awards. Dang. So, um, we'd like to thank all the great people that came before us. <laughs> Ilya Repin. Ilya Repin. Vladimir Mayakovsky. Viktor Tsoi. And Marx and Engels for providing us the political education. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's right. Uh, I am. Pre Was this originally a Ukrainian game? Um, their accent reminded me. Um, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, this this deserved. I mean, not just for best indie game. This this is again the best game, the most impressive game that I have. I, again, the the game that I've that has impressed me the most in maybe ever, you know, in decades. Um. Uh. Uh. Estonian, gosh, Estonian, man. Um, I I do say. Uh, somebody said, like, hey, Pat, do you believe that video games are now a, a valid v medium for storytelling? Something so, yeah, of course. But the thing is, they have been for like 30 fucking years. And in my opinion, they've taken a huge step backwards in the last 20. Like, there were such amazing, narratively complex games. <sighs> um, that that promoted problem solving and and nonlinear thinking and that were puzzling and clever um and then like and and then everyone's like but how, what if we make everything photorealistic and um and it's like, well, sure, great, good job. Now Kratos has all of the pixels and polygons, but it's just, it's just kind of like you've made some, so you've made some weird, gross monsters, and there's a muscle dude, and he's gonna sword hit him. And I'm like, great, great, cool. I mean, sure, that's fun, that's entertainment, do that, but. You know, honestly, it's what has happened to a lot of movies as well. Um, you know, look at how much money they spend on uh, special effects compared to, um, you know, script. And it'll show you where their priority is. Um, I remember hearing about 
Papers, Please. Um, I don't. I might have played Outer Wilds. Is that the one where there's like the horrible over corporation that is selling you everything? You know that I, that was about as that was a fairly standard like um um yeah horrible space capitalists um i mean that that was a about as much as i dared to hope from a game um that was kind of big big corporate game um you know it had it it, it had it had most everything you would expect um reasonably well executed um you know no no real innovation especially like and again this is comparing it to something like disco elysium which is like just looking at the character generation screen you're like these people are deeply insane you know who would make a game like this um oh outer worlds yeah um um bastion i i don't think i played bastion um outer worlds is anti-capitalist fallout in space yeah um Outer, Outer Wilds was second only to Disco Elysium. Interesting. Interesting. Um, um, huh. The Wilds is one of the best games I've ever played. It's a truly unfortunate double up in name similarity, uh, given that it came out at the same time as Outer Worlds, because I remember Outer Worlds was just everywhere. Everyone was talking about it. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Ooh, yeah, Subnautica also so so good. I I profoundly I think Subnautica might have been my favorite game that I have played recently before. Um, you know, before I played um um uh, before I played Disco Elysium. I, I very much uh, loved Subnautica, and I'm waiting for the next one to come out. Um, interesting. Subnautica currently free on PS4. Um, I wonder if they're doing that to drum up interest, if they are going to take... Um, the next Subnautica out of early access soon. Um, yeah, there's a stigma about them. Um, I mean, I think, uh, um, oh, as somebody with thalassophobia, thalass, Thalassia? Is that relating to fish? I mean, that would make the game kind of unplayable. Um, C. Fuck. Like, I mean, it's fear of open water or the deep ocean. Yeah, so you're double fucked there. Uh, hmm. Man, uh, maybe uh, you could also maybe just like slam your dick in a car door real hard a bunch if that's what you're looking for in in a game is something to do that you're very afraid of a lot um man fuck no man's sky um uh i played that for a lot you know like a lot a lot and i was really into it and i'm like cool now let's see the rest of the universe and it was garbage um Uh, sorry, I have some feelings there. I did actually play Loop Hero, um, and the gameplay is really good. Um, 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 and then, like, I, I 
I, I beat it because it's just effectively a system manipulator game. And so I, I crushed it because it's not a terribly complex system. And I just don't know what, and I'm like, I kind of wanted more out of the ending, but it was, it was fun, bite-sized little game. You know, for me, it was good for a couple, couple, like maybe a week. Um, Uh, best Discworld book. There's so many, but I have a particular fondness for Monstrous Regiment or Thud. Um, oh yeah, I played the Bioshocks back in the day. I haven't played the most recent one. I was going to stream it and I played like the very first session of Bioshock Infinite online. And then I just kind of, eh. Uh, Guards Guards is very good. Um, oh, as the person who kept hollering about Disco Elysium 2 before you played it, I'd recommend it. Thank you, Just to Watch. Uh, you did me a great service. You and several others uh, really, um, you know, really, really did me a favor there uh, by introducing me to this game and all, all I've done since is blow a trumpet about it. Um, I didn't play cyber punk 2020. Uh, um, uh, I kind of I I kind of asked around about it and it seems like a lot of there was a lot of fuckery involved in that game and uh I didn't necessarily want to pour any pour any fuel on that fire um um uh plus it didn't it sounded really buggy and I'm like eh um Um, uh, Infocom I grew up with that those games shaped me um, and I'm finding a way to bring them to my boys because um, uh, I think that they'll love them those, those are games that taught me how to think and how to solve problems and how to just beat my head against a puzzle until I solve it. I'll keep this clear and concise. Do you have any resources you look to when world building? I'm in the brainstorming stages of game development and any direction would be amazing. I don't know. I mean, saying like, what's a resource for world building? It's it's just a hopelessly broad topic. Um, um, I played the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, Infocom game. See, that one I finished. I did not finish Bureaucracy. Uh, oh, a game, that one still haunts me. Uh, I never could find the white courtesy phone, uh, which is a statement that will baffle everyone in this chat except for maybe a person um 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 oh here we go somebody says uh cyberpunk 77 was a mess when it could have been just huge, and that saddens me enough to hate on CD. Oh, it was CD Projekt Red? So this was their follow-up to Witcher, effectively. Oof. Man, after that, they kind of had the world on a string. Um, um, it's too bad. It's too bad. Um...
Um, um, I mean, that, that said, um, you know, the original Witcher game, oof a doof, that had some stuff in it. Like, you're running, I mean, fair enough, you're running around as a sexy wizard monster killer use immortal and immune to disease so like you know the 14 year old in me is like but if i'm immortal and hot and with powers and immune to disease then and also i'm built and i'm a, a monster killer you know like then obviously i i finally get to kiss a girl right and witcher was like not only can you kiss girls but like if you have sex with them in the game, you get collector's cards. And I'm like, excuse me, what? Uh, oof. Um, <laughs> you know, like, that's... Mm. I mean, again, if I'd been 14 and playing it, that just would have been the coolest thing ever, but I'm older now. Uh, and we don't we don't need that more of that bullshit in the world. Um... Well, I mean, to be fair, it wasn't all women being collectible cards. It was just it was just the ones you could sleep with. Only only the women you can sleep with are worth collecting. Right? Which is like just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of why shit like that is horrifyingly problematic. Um Well, I don't know. Somebody says between Witcher and Witcher 2, it was a huge step for that company. It showed how to learn from their past releases. I'm like, I don't know. Like, Cyberpunk uh, 2077, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't impress a lot of my friends with how they handled a lot of some of the criticism that was made of of some transgender stuff and body stuff uh and again like now we look back and we're like yeah maybe don't make women into sex trading cards and we, we look back and we're like oh yeah oh my god why did they do that and these days a lot of people are like ah so what like it's like ah that trans stuff it's very fringy and blah 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 it's like only only a few ultra liberals care about that. In 20 years, you're going to look back and everyone's going to be like, oh God, yeah, this was deeply ignorant. Um, 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 yeah, I mean, representation of sex in video games is a problem. Like a lot, so many things would be okay if our culture wasn't like deeply, deeply, deeply unhealthy in its relationship to sex, gender, sexuality, power, like the whole thing. But, you know, like it's sort of like if you have a relative that is sick, you need to be very careful around them to like not infect them, you know? And we have a culture that is very sick in some ways and all of the people who live in the culture, we kind of have to be careful not to, like, reinforce a lot of the bad, unhealthy, sick, th sick things in it. Like, if, if everyone sort of, like, was supported and healthy and we had a lot of our, like, then it wouldn't be dangerous to have some of this stuff. But, yeah. Um... Sex is a good. Somebody says, I think a huge part of that is our culture is too easily offended and wants everything wrapped around their own ideas. Uh, and I, I, I say, ask this as a real question, B. Bellamy, and someone who wants to engage in uh, uh, some intellectual discourse and is also curious. Um, are you a, 
uh, how old are you, if you don't mind sharing, and are you white? Um, I, I, I'm curious about that context to uh, your comment there. Uh, because I used to feel the same way. And I'm like, eh, why is everybody so touchy? It's fine. And I was a 20-year-old white guy. And I felt like, why is everybody so sensitive? I was just making a joke about feminism, you know? And it's like, oops, yeah, like, maybe, maybe don't, yeah. Uh, oh, 37. Um, uh, uh, boy, color of skin doesn't matter. Yeah, love novels, books, maybe... Unless you're really coming here to like kind of stir up some shit. Um, um, maybe just chill out a bit and and just hang out on the stream. Um, 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 yeah. Um, on the other hand, if you are trying to start some shit, feel free to run your mouth a little bit more and we'll just kind of prune you out of this chat. Um, you know, but what I say is like, again, you know, as somebody who grew up in a mostly white area, you know, you know, you don't see racism and you don't feel racism and and I'm like, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, that racism stuff was bad before we fixed it, right? Um, but but also I was, you know, I, I, I've been lucky enough to be more informed since then and make some friends since then and sort of grow and change and learn more about the fact that, oh, fuck, we've got some real problems. Um so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, as somebody here says, Pat, thank you for being inclusive. It's like, well, I, I try my best. It's a complicated subject. Nobody benefits from being, um, 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 uh, Oh, uh, B. Bellamy, thank you so much when you say what you mean is that no one wants to see things from someone else's viewpoint. I could care less. Uh, I was just trying to back up your point. Okay, cool. I probably misunderstood uh, uh, where you, what you were going for, Bellamy. Thank you for being understanding uh, and not being offended or thinking that I was kind of coming after you there. Um, um, uh Adam, I'm raising a family in a mostly white area and sometimes feel like I'm doing my child a disservice. Do you ever feel that way? Um, I mean, you can't always trust your environment to be what you want it to for kids. Um, and that is true in many ways. But like, so if your environment, say, there's a lot of air pollution outside, well, then you make sure your kid wears a mask. Um, um uh, and if there's, you know, you know, if your children aren't exposed to the reality of what racism is like for everyone, that's important if I want them to grow up to be conscious and helpful and sort of fully functional, articulate human beings participating in, you know, in life. Um, and so I need to expose them to stories so they learn more about sexism and racism. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I don't think I need to move somewhere else to help them be aware of certain things. Um, we, we just talk about them. I'm a person of color. Can I get a pass to make fun of feminists just for fun? Uh, you know, I used to, I used to 
believe in that. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, it's sort of like, uh, it's like, well, how about this? Can I, um, uh, if in the same way that like, you remember carbon credits? It's like, oh, if we're going to save the world, everyone has to reduce carbon emissions. And so it's like some countries just already had like these carbon credits. And, uh, and so like other countries that wanted to like f fuck the environment or didn't care about it, they would just like, Ooh, can we buy your carbon credits? You're still, f you're still like shitting in the world. Right. Um, and so similarly, you know, uh, and schnooze, I'm assuming you're kind of making a joke here, but you know, well, how about this? It's like, I run a charity. Does that mean that I can kick a dog every once in a while because I'm, I'm, I'm in the plus column in terms of karma? Uh, probably not. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, and, and it's tricky because the more you know about the world, it makes it hard. I used to make a lot more jokes. I used to be much more funny to more people, but also I reinforced a lot of really unhealthy cultural stereotypes. And, um, you know, and I used to think like, well, if I make a joke, if I make fun of somebody, then like, like you might not like it, the person I'm making fun of, but you're just one person. And then like a hundred people read the little thing I write in the paper. So if a hundred people laugh and only one person is hurt, like that's utilitarian comedy, right? And what I realize now is that not only should you try to not hurt anyone ever if you can help it, but, you know, if I'm making people write, laugh by effectively reinforcing their stereotypes or like sort of cementing their unhealthy cultural beliefs, they might laugh and enjoy it, but I'm actually hurting that person too. Um, um, again, it's, it's not as fun having this level of awareness and feeling this sort of ethical responsibility, it kind of depends on what you feel like your job is in the world. Are are you here in the world in order to have fun and just enjoy yourself? And, you know, or are you, are we here to sort of try to help each other and, um, and maybe make things better? Um, You know, and uh, that's a good point with Chappelle. A, a lot of these transgressive comedians, uh, it happened with Richard Pryor. He was in, he was out there swinging. Um, um, he was out there swinging and really like big part of civil rights and like one of the first really big black comedians. Um, and then he kind of reconsidered like... He was like, I'm pushing back. I'm challenging these things. And then eventually he's like, you know what? I don't think I am. And he, he changed the sort of humor he did. Um, now see, Olate, uh, that's a cop out. When you say you can't avoid hurting people, um, it's not a helpful way to think. Um, um Um, oh, so here's an interesting thing. Uh, somebody says, as a 32 year old white guy, it was come, it was a really confronting journey, forcing myself to learn how lucky that made me. But the more effort I put into that, the more I like myself for becoming more compassionate and understanding of my place in the world. It's not a negative. I envy you that, um, Rapscallion. Um, uh, as I learn, you know, I've kind of, there's a lot of other factors with me. Um, 
a lot of other factors that I won't trouble anyone with here. Um, the more and more I learn, you know, I, I regret the freedom that I used to have. Part of it is the fact that as I have a bit of a social media platform, um, for me, if I make a little misstep, it's magnified. Um, uh, you know, we're just like, if you're a regular person and you're just hanging out in your living room and talking to your two friends and you make a joke that's in, insensitive or potentially hurtful, you know, and maybe they're hurt or maybe they're not or whatever. But if you do that and you have like, say, a quarter million Twitter followers, then not only might people actually be hurt, but I might be doing a disservice to the people who aren't hurt by modeling bad behavior. And then they think, oh, well, Pat Rothfuss made that joke that once. I guess it's fine. You know, Pat does a charity. Pat cares about doing the right thing. Um, you know, I I worry about that a lot. I worry about that a lot. Um, do I feel like I'm, I, I feel like my negative impact on the world is better because I do worry about it. Uh, but just the way that I phrase that reveals something where what I'm saying is like, you know, I'm trying to ameliorate my potential negative impact on the world. Um, but it can be kind of paralyzing too. Um, um, is there value in offensive comedy? Um, I mean, not sure. Um, in subversion? Yes. Private gallows humor. Again, private humor is different than public humor. Um, 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 oh, well, thank you. Uh, what is it? Levitt Cleos. Uh, we roll a little different around here. Um, I mean, I played a video game and made jokes about butts and cussed a bunch earlier, uh, but now we've sort of wandered into a different discussion uh, because that's that's what we do. Um, um, oh yeah, of course I I worry about that much more with my writing because my writing is much more impactful. You know, if I write something and it's in one of the books, then ten million people will read that. I mean, assuming it gets published, right? Um, well, now here, uh, Varanid shares a common opinion that is common, uh, that is f accepted by a lot of people and believed by a lot of people. However, I'd like to push back on where somebody here says making jokes at the offense of powerful people is fine, even if it hurts their feelings. Making a jo joke at the expense of powerless people is not comedy. It's just mean. Um, and so, um, and, and the theory here is that like, and, and the way people phrase this a lot of times is they say, um, like you shouldn't punch up or you shouldn't put punch down. You should only punch up. And there is some truth to this, you know, um, because like if I pick a newbie author and I just rip their books to shreds. You know, I have a lot of power. They're just getting their start. Like, I think it's undeniable that that's a dick move. Um, but assuming, but then it's like, oh, but it's okay to do that so long as it's someone powerful. Like, why do you want to punch at all? Punching is not good. I mean, we all know punching isn't good, right? This is a basic thing that you should learn as a kid. It's like, hey, don't hit. Um, um, and so, um, um, uh, and, and saying this as someone with a fair amount of power, you know, uh, it, it, like in a very specialized community, right? In terms of real famous people, I'm not famous, but compared to what I used to be, which is like, you know, hey, I've got a MySpace page. You know, hey, you know, a hundred people read my column in the local paper. Compared to that, yeah, I'm famous. 
And so a lot of people go, cool, he's powerful. And it's like, cool, I'm going to say mean things about them. But guess what? Here, here it is. Here is a, here is that person. Um, um, and see, hear what you said, Veronid. Are you saying that it's okay for people to hurt my feelings? Because that's literally what you said. You said making jokes at the expense of powerful people is fine, even if it hurts their feelings. So is what you're saying is that it's okay for someone less powerful than me to hurt my feelings? Because I I would I used to believe that. Um but it's not healthy and I'm learning that maybe I should not feel okay. Um I I, I maybe shouldn't be okay with people doing things that hurt me. Um and Veranid here says, a joke always is at the expense, uh, hold on, a joke always is someone else's expense, is it not? Um, oh, and here Veranid is also hitting a very good point. Um, um, I'd be curious where humor comes from if not at someone else's expense. And here's the, the truth is, a lot of humor is at someone's expense. An American, a German, and a Polak walk into a bar. Um, how many blondes does it take to screw in a light bulb? Um, uh, um, did you hear the one about the neck beard? Did you... Um, uh, only in Lena jokes, you know? Um, um, all of these jokes are effectively... They're making fun of someone or a group of people. And that means it's like, and and ultimately what you're doing when you tell a joke like that is you're saying, hey, get, hey, everybody, hey, everybody, guess what? Dumbs are, blondes are super fucking dumb. Isn't this hysterical? And it's like, there's more to it. There's timing and there's craft and whatever. But ultimately that's what you're doing. Um, and you can do that. And those jokes are funny. But I, you know, do you know how they used to, like, if you were going to make paint, you know what made the best white paint that all the artists wanted to use? You had to put lead in it. Um, and they got really the, the best, longest lasting, whitest paint. And it had lead in it. And it poisoned painters. Um, and so, and it poisoned a lot of people, you know, like, and, and that's like just on canvases, like there was paint on the walls and on windows and whatever. And you might, and you might say like, oh, but you need to have art, right? Well, you need to have like, you have need to protect your house from inclement weather. And I'm like, well, can't we find better paint? Uh, do we need it to be that white? Can we, can we not tell a joke that maybe poisons us all a little in ways that maybe we don't understand really well? Um, and it's sad that part of, I think, becoming informed and emotionally mature is realizing how easy it is to hurt people. Um, and if you care about not hurting people, and then you learn how easy it is to hurt people, it's rough. Um, it sucks. Because that means you have to do a lot of work to be careful. Um, but in my opinion, you either acknowledge that what you want to do is be careful of people and that that's your priority and that that's what you want to do in the world, or you say, actually, what I really want to do, though, is tell a joke and have people think I'm cool. Um, just, I mean, yeah. Um, hurt people, hurt people, man. Fuck, librarian of doom. 
Penny Red wrote that sentence and it will never not be good. Um, um, And see, now, just to watch here is brought up, going back to mocking the powerful, I don't think there's anything with, wrong with mocking uh, the billionaire owner of the lead paint company who knows the lead is poisonous. So that's a little different. That isn't just like, you know, um, you know that, that isn't just like, oh, you're telling jokes about, you know, First Nations people or whatever. Like, speaking truth to power, I am a... You know, I am a I'm a big fan of that. Like, uh, I'm all I'm all about that. Um, you know, um, but like, there's there's a lot to be said about like, is satirical humor a powerful, like, communication tool to affect change? And here is like, uh, and believe you, if you think we're in a rabbit hole now, you don't want to get me started on the purpose of satire in discourse communities, I have actually personally been written about by folklorists um, and like how like cultural memory is transmitted. Um, you know, maybe we'll do that some other time. Um, but this is something I think about a lot. Um, obviously, I think about this a lot. Um, um, Uh, Cosmic, um, if you are interested in this conversation and you're 21, uh, congratulations. You're miles ahead of me when I was that age. Um, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking about things, but I wasn't thinking about these things. Um, and I've been lucky, fell in with a good group of intelligent, socially progressive people, uh, at a different time in my life, I fell in with some, um, uh, you know, a really great group of feminists who took care of me and kind of were gentle with me, even though I was wrongheaded about a lot of things. Um, 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 do you have, do you think having things in your past that you're ashamed of regarding saying things that could hurt others, can you make you hyper aware of your actions? Um, I mean, I don't know about people in general. Um, I know that I, you know, I used to, I used to be kind of a punk kid. Um, um, uh, and so I, I try to be more careful than I used to be. Um, oh no, this is interesting just to watch. I, I'm not able to keep up with all of what's happening in the chat here. Um, um, uh, just because, you know, if I'm going to try to actually speak these things clearly and articulately, I can't be reading a bunch of conversations at the same time. Uh, but somebody here just to watch says, to be clear, you shouldn't mock the billionaire owner of the lead paint company for being fat, but for being an asshole who's poisoning the earth, uh, they say being a monster. And this is, this is actually a great example um, like when Trump was around, people would be like, you know, fuck this orange face, you know, like 
weird hair motherfucker. And I'm like, you know, or they're like, ha, 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 Trump looks really fat. And I'm like, huh. Like, really? We're just, you know, I think it's okay to, if you really, I, I mean, if you don't like someone and so you make fun of their appearance, you're shitty. That's a shitty thing to do and you're being shitty. And it doesn't matter how Trump, how bad Trump is. If if you don't like someone and so you make fun of their physical appearance, it's shitty. And I'm sorry. And I'm not saying that maybe you don't, you know, you know, like it might, uh, let's create a childhood built bully that I had, right? Um, and I'm like, oh, Greggy Montauban, you know, ooh, beat me up all the time. Um, God, he was fat, you know? It's like, well, what am I, you know, ugh, ugly, ugly kid. Like, well, no, like, what am I trying to get across there? Um, it's like, if if he beat me up all the time and stole my shit, that's, that's what the bad thing is. And we should talk about that. You know, it's not that he's bad because he's fat. Because that's what you're implying. If you hate somebody and then you're like, I hate them and they're ugly, then you're like, oh boy. You know, um, because, you know, I have weird hair and I'm fat. So if that's really your issue with Trump, then man, why are you here on this stream? Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, if you hate Trump because he was kind of a narcissist and a fascist and really damaged the concept of like democracy and really substantively hurt a lot of people and kind of promoted racism, cool. But like, talk about that because those things, in my opinion, are super really bad. Uh, don't criticize his tie. Um, um, yeah, and this is something that actually happens all through narrative. Um, um, you know, uh, it's something that uh, was is sort of universal, especially in old comics, where, um, and they talk about it in, uh, oh, what was it? Uh, Unbreakable, a, a movie that I really enjoyed, um, where uh, uh, Samuel Jackson's character, Mr. Glass, was talking about like, ooh, and all these superhero books, you always know who the villain is. Uh, because the villain is somebody who has a physical deformity um, or they are um, uh, or ugly or like, you know, like maybe they're very small or very tall. Um, and, you know, again, if that happens, you know, once in a story, it's it's one thing, but like if all of your supervillains, you know, are just like physically malformed, then what does that say about how you feel about people with disabilities? You know, also like, what are you sort of, what about kids that grow up in a little town and their only exposure to people with disabilities is like, oh, these are the e evil masterminds that are kidnapping nuns and kicking puppies, you know? Um, it's, it's, stories are about more than they seem to be about, and it's how we learn about the world. Um, it's just, it's complicated. I mean, there's a reason that I always pitch panels about the ethical responsibility of the storyteller. Um, um, Uh, 
Uh, Edmund I, or maybe it's Edmund AI, says, My favorite author is looking for an editor. They do web serials and are looking to edit them. Oh, your favorite author is looking, oh, not for a book editor. They're looking for a video editor. Um, do you have a good person in mind? I do not know a really good video editor. Um, um, yeah, Amber NF and you know, Amber, you know, describes, uh, uh, you know, in, in Harry Potter, you know, Dudley is sort of described, you know, in a, like a little pig. Um, and again, it's easy shorthand and, you know, you know, you describe people in an unflattering way and it's, it's an easy way to do what you want to like kind of get what you want out of your reader in a story. But again, like how bad do you want that paint to be that white? You know, could, could we, could we spend a little more money developing a different kind of paint so that we can paint our bad characters in a way that isn't poisonous. Um, Also, I'd like to thank everybody for really being good participants in this discussion. I mean, I'm seeing a little bit of back and forth but here in the chat, but um, by and large, I, I really appreciate people sort of doing what I think of as good faith arguments, which is making honest points and you know asking honest questions and trying to assume the best about the people you're talking to here. Uh, which is to say you're not looking to pick a fight just to fight or get offended at the at the the quickest opportunity um um so um and that's that's a real rare thing on the internet and that's um again i i i appreciate y'all uh and i it makes me proud of this stream it makes me feel like uh, uh, it makes me proud of our little our little island of sanity uh, here on the internet. Um, 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 yeah, healthy discussion is how we grow. It's so hard to find places for healthy discussion. The internet does not, it does not naturally arise in a lot of places um, on the internet. Uh, off topic, do I set aside time for writing or you do you do it spontaneously? In a life where I have a lot of free time, having it happen spontaneously is great. As my life has become increasingly busy and pressing and full, uh, if you want, if you want anything to happen, you have to schedule it. I mean, I have to schedule like talking to a friend. If I don't, I don't, I have to schedule like getting my laundry done or I don't. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Nadevin, that's a very good point. Arguments are supposed to be a cooperative effort to, uh, find the truth, not a competition to see who can score more points. Um, 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 you know, I, I am looking to stream more often. Um, um, uh, what do I mean by ethics? Ugh, that's That by itself is a big question. Um, of all the things that I studied, um, when I was into philosophy, I never actually took, um, I, I never actually took a straight up ethics class. Ethics was merely a part of other, 
uh, philosophy classes I took, but still, that's just such a big question. Um, yeah, I wish. I think civil discourse is something our society needs in order to be better and make itself better. And it is a shame that it's not taught. I mean, you get things like debate club. That's not civil discourse. Um, I participated in something that was called um, philosophy club where we talked about ideas and there were rules of engagement. And it was like, hey, we're here to discuss ideas and be friendly and this stuff is inbounds and this stuff is out of bounds. So talk nice. Um, uh, yeah, like debate club, like a rigorous debate is about winning. It's not, it's not a Socratic, you know, uh, you know, collaborative search for truth. Um, you failed law and ethics in college twice. Dang, man, that's a, that's a oof, oof, a oof. Um, 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 ah, man, I hurt my finger today, or rather, I think my finger was slightly injured yesterday, and today it hurts a lot, and I'm a little worried about it. You'd be amazed how many things you have to do with the pointer finger on your right hand. I mean, I do a lot of my favorite things with this hand. It's just it's a lot. And when it hurts, if you use it, it inhibits those things. Um, uh, uh, cosmic, I think you're right. And, and it's good to have fear for argument and debate, especially if you've been burned in the past by people who have sort of been arguing in bad faith where it seems like they're trying to discuss with you, but what they're really looking to do is just prove that they're smarter or that their thing is right. Um, um, good debate and good discussion and good discourse, so many things have to come from trust. Um, and trust is a commodity. Um, how do you turn a bad faith argument into something productive? Is it possible or do you just walk away? That's a big one. Um, I think you saw me do it where I said, hey, ooh, hey, person that said this here in the chat, you know, if you're just if you're just trying to start some shit with with this real out of the can basic ass bullshit argument, please don't. I go. Or if you really believe that, maybe chill out and sort of listen to the discourse happening here to find out sort of how we talk about these things. Um, I go, or if you are just looking to like kind of shit in everyone's picnic, do it boldly so that we'll know and we can kind of show you the door because, you know, we're having a, I don't want to say a cool kid party in here. We're having a, a, a human being party in here, which means that you're empathetic and kind and considerate and we're careful of each other and we acknowledge that we all kind of fuck up and we really try not to double down on that. Um, and we're just, we're just careful. Um, 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 I'll say by and large, you cannot fix a bad faith argument on the internet. Um, uh, we are having a very particular type of geek party. Um, I would be tempted to refer to it as a symposium, except it is not, uh, because technically uh, that translates into wine drinking party, and I have no wine. Um, did I always think about mental health a lot? No. Uh, no, not until I started to shatter uh, and become uh, a ruined human being. Um, um, yeah, I mean, if, if y'all have wine, then maybe this is a symposium. Uh, also a symposium would kind of be, uh, smaller, 
and uh, a little cozier in my opinion. Um, um, how about this? Good discussion. Good discussion among uh, considerate people. Um, 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 I a, a pav- palaver, uh, banana slamma. Fuck you, that name, man. Uh, palaver is a very good word. Good job. Um. Um. Yeah, not a lot of symposiums with 500 people. Um, uh, but what I will say here is I've really enjoyed this. I was going to maybe hang around for, what, maybe, um, you know, an extra 15 minutes. Um, and instead, I, I've really enjoyed this sort of gentle, uh, hopefully, like, informative or somehow meaningful conversation um, but now I'm thinking, what if, what if I sent y'all, oh man, okay, everybody, we have an easy choice today. I'm going to send you to Felicia Day, who is currently playing Dungeons and Dragons with the cast of the guild. Um, uh, and I'm going to go off and I'm going to eat some food and relax and, Try to just remember how to be a regular human being for maybe a couple hours before I jump into the work week. Um, uh, So let me, give me a sec here. How do I, where's my chat window? Um, I want to do a raid. And let's do it for Felicia Day. Um, So be nice over in that channel. And tell them all I love them, and that, uh, like, um, and that they're amazing. Um, they are good, good people. They are delightfully funny, and I love me some tabletop role playing. Uh, they bring joy into the world. Uh, if you want to catch me in the future, uh, make sure to follow the channel. If you um have enjoyed this uh i'll be doing more of this in the future um also check out my cool lighting that i i do now because i'm taking very basic steps uh to be slightly less of a shitty uh streamer uh low quality streamer um but uh but yeah go have fun and and tell those lovely people uh how much we appreciate them Uh, bringing joy and art into the world. I will talk to you all soon and take care of yourselves and take care of the people that you love. Boop.